It was here that hundreds died of disease and cold. Here murderers took the life of a founding father, and here the Mississippi River was first bridged. It's also a place that has helped arm and supply U.S. military troops since the Civil War. Hello, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Surrounded by the Quad Cities and the Mississippi River is this island. Today it's home to one of the last government-owned arsenals, and its history begins at the end of the War of 1812. During that war, two of the westernmost battles were fought near here. So after the war, it was decided to construct a series of forts along the upper portion of the river, not only to protect the settlers, but to halt the invasion of the British and French fur trappers. One of those was Fort Armstrong, which later gained prominence when it served as a military headquarters for the Black Hawk War of 1832. Today the site is marked by this recreated blockhouse erected in 1916 on the fort's 100th anniversary. After the war, the fort became an ordnance depot for the western region, sort of a forerunner of the island's eventual mission, a mission which came about because of another conflict. This time it was the Civil War. After the loss of the Harper's Ferry Arsenal, Congress established sites for three new facilities. Rock Island was the westernmost location chosen, and although construction of these buildings didn't begin until after the war, the island did play a part. Just off the main road is this cemetery that contains the remains of close to 2,000 Confederate soldiers captured during the battles of Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge in Tennessee. They began arriving at the prison camp in December of 1863. As in most prisons of that time, disease and winter's cold took a devastating toll. On display at the Arsenal Island Museum are photos of the prison, along with pictures drawn by the prisoners depicting camp life. To earn extra money for food and tobacco, prisoners who were craftsmen were allowed to make objects to sell to the guards and civilians. One of the most elaborate items sold was this violin made by Private E. Perdue of the 7th Florida Infantry. Their guards were members of the 108th Colored Troops, many of whom were former slaves. And like their charges, many of them died from camp diseases. The remains are now located in what is called the Rock Island National Cemetery. Welcome back to the Arsenal Museum which demonstrates that the missions fulfilled here have been quite diverse. For example, this horse was one of several used by dressmakers to ensure the fit of artillery harnesses. It's a reminder that the Arsenal's mission has been more than just ordnance. There were leather shops for saddles, holsters, and cartridge boxes, tin shops to make mess kits, and carpenters to construct the carriages for siege guns. In addition, the arsenal was responsible for the repair and cleaning of weapons to be reissued. Later on, it became the second facility to manufacture the 1903 Springfield rifle, which was used by the infantry in World War I. That was the first weapon that placed a lot of emphasis on having interchangeable parts for field repairs. This boring machine is the only known device left from those days. Interestingly, the museum is located in the same room where the 1903 rifle was made. Besides recalling the arsenal's past, the museum is probably best known for its collection of small arms, which extends across two walls. Behind me are some unique and rare items which come from almost every period of our nation's history. For example, here's a wall gun from around 1776, which weighs 50 pounds. It's a combination of a rifle and small cannon, which was mounted on a swivel yoke attached to a fort's wall. Today, only six of these weapons are known to exist. There's also a large selection of weapons that have a known association with Native Americans. Several are still wrapped with rawhide that was used to repair broken or splintered wood. Others were personalized with engravings of animal figures. 
Some of the weapons took on a new importance after fire cleared the site of the Battle of the Little Big Horn. Archaeologists were able to discover some spent casings, and using modern ballistic techniques, they determined that the museum had five guns that were actually used by tribe members on that day. These rifles are the single largest collection of identified weapons used by Native Americans that day that are accessible to the public. In addition, scientists were able to determine where each gun had been used during the battle. For example, this rifle was used at the beginning of the fight, later at Last Stand Hill, and again at the Reno Benteen defense line. And besides these rifles, the museum also has on display several other items that were recovered from the battlefield. Congress established the arsenal in 1862 during the Civil War. But because of labor shortages and material shortages, the first building wasn't completed until 1867. That first building was this impressive looking warehouse, which was used until after World War I. Today it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places and is the home of the Rock Island District of the Corps of Engineers. But what attracts the most attention is here on the sixth floor. It was in this room in 1868 that the owner of the nationally known Hotchkiss Company installed the clockworks, and they're still running. Mr. Hotchkiss himself came here in January of 1868 and installed the clock, which at that time cost $5,000. Its wooden pendulum hangs down two stories and is capped with a 350-pound ball. There are four clock faces connected to the works by a series of rods and gears, and each face has 12 porthole windows, which offer a great view of the Quad Cities area and also of the eagles that gather along the river during the winter months. In addition to the clock tower, another building of note is the home of the commanding general for the Operations Support Command. It's the second largest government-owned single-family residence. Only the White House is larger. The first tenant was to have been the man who designed and oversaw much of the arsenal's construction, General Rodman. Unfortunately, he passed away before the home was completed, but his funeral was held in the unfinished building. Inside, the main rooms are accented with ceiling medallions, cornices, Italian marble mantles, and floors that are bordered with a diamond parquet pattern. Most of the ironwork and brass fixtures used in the home were forged here in the arsenal shops. Overall, the house consists of three floors and over 50 rooms. High-ranking military and government officials and friends of the commanding general are guests in the house from time to time. In 1927, during a cross-country tour, Charles Lindbergh spent the night here. Quarters One remains a private residence and is open for tours only on special occasions. This is Memorial Field. It's dedicated to the memory of those employees who lost their lives during the Second World War. It's also a reminder that since its beginning, the arsenal has been the Army's main producer of towed artillery weapons. One of the island's most successful products, designed and developed here, is this 155 millimeter howitzer. It was used extensively during the Gulf War and is capable of firing standard artillery ammunition and rocket-assisted laser-guided rounds. At other times, engineers here are asked to evaluate or redesign existing weapons, such as this 105 millimeter light gun produced by Britain. The arsenal brought the system up to U.S. Army specs while re-engineering stress areas in the frame. Today, the arsenal is the government's largest owned and operated production facility. It's a place that has fulfilled a variety of missions on an island that has played a role in almost all of our country's conflicts. Today, visitors are still learning about the arsenal's various roles in history at the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. Nearby, each Memorial Day, Confederate flags still grace the headstones of the old prison cemetery. 
and at the western end, the clock installed at the arsenal's beginning is still keeping time. For more information about public sites on the island, or times the Arsenal Museum is open, call the Public Affairs Office at 309-782-5421. Visitors to the Rock Island Arsenal may enter through the Moline Gate only. A photo ID is required and your vehicle may be subject to search. To schedule a tour of the Clock Tower Building, call 309-794-5338 or 309-794-5204.